it was a massive, massive, massive story in Britain and indeed beyond throughout the last few months of 1962 and the first few months of 63. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place for first-hand Cold War history accounts. Thanks to financial supporter Mark Brain for providing today's intro. And make sure you hit that follow button in your podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. Alex Grant's new book, Sex, Spies and Scandal, The John Vassal Affair, has everything. A honey trap, industrial-scale espionage, journalists jailed for not revealing their sources, and the first modern tabloid witch hunt which resulted in ministerial resignation and almost brought down Harold Macmillan's government. With access to newly released MI5 files and people who knew Vassal, this book sheds new light on a neglected spy scandal, despite having been drugged and sexually assaulted by the KGB in Moscow, as a gay man, John Vassal was shown no mercy by the British press or the courts. Sentenced to 18 years in jail, he served 10 years despite telling MI5 everything. Once released, he found that many of his old friends and lovers had been persecuted or dismissed from the civil service in Britain, America and Australia. Buy the book via the links in the episode notes and support the podcast. I'm delighted to welcome Alex Grant to our Cold War conversation. I was born in 1973, so I, I was born you know, 10 years after most of the key events of the Vassal case. If you speak to people of our, our parents' generation, my mum and dad are in the early 80s, they do remember the case, but they often have to be kind of prompted about it before because it was, if you look at the press archives, it was a massive, massive, massive story in Britain and indeed beyond throughout the last few months of 1962 and the first few months of 63. But because the Profumo scandal came you know, hot on the heels of the Vassal one in spring 1963 onwards, it's almost as if memories of the more slightly more photogenic Profumo scandal erased memories of the Vassal one. The Profumo scandal involved John Profumo, the 46-year-old Secretary of State for War in Harold Macmillan's Conservative government, who had an extramarital affair with a 19-year-old model, Christine Keeler, who was also in a relationship with a Soviet naval attaché. And for, yeah, for reasons I'm sure we'll you know, be discussing later, there, there were you know, reasons why the Vassal scandal was, at least in relative terms, forgotten about, while the Profumo scandal, as we know, has, has endured. But it was it was just as big a deal in terms of the national security impact, in terms of the political impact, in terms of the legal impact and social impact at the time as Perfumo was. So I, I felt it was high time this was written about at book length. And it has obviously been written about in many, many books over the last 60 years, sometimes quite well, sometimes, frankly, quite badly. The only book that has been solely devoted to the Vassal story before mine was written way back in 1963 by Rebecca West. It was very much an instant sort of journalistic history of the scandal. And while very detailed and in some ways very thorough, it was also you know, full of homophobia at the time. She was very unsympathetic towards Vassal, whereas my book is, while not you know, naively believing everything that Vassal ever said, because he was sometimes an unreliable narrator of his own story, I am rather more sympathetic towards Vassal for reasons I'll explain. And it looks like you've discovered a load more information via the National Archives, so you've had more documentary evidence to work with, and you've you've spoken to some people who actually work with him as well. Yes, I had a lucky break in that about 18 months ago, in late 2022, the National Archives, without any prior warning, suddenly declassified hundreds and hundreds of pages from MI5 primarily, but also other other government departments about the case. And I also tracked down a number of people, as you say, Ian, I tracked down a number of people who'd known Vassal, not just from his afterlife, after his release from prison, his release from prison in 1972, but also people who'd known him in the 1950s while he was a spy 
who'd also known him in prison in Wormwood Scrubs in the early 1960s, as well as a number of people who had known him between his release from prison and his death in 1996. It's fair to say that because a lot of the key events of this story happened in the 1950s and early 1960s, many of the people who knew Vassal or can shed much light on the story are no longer with us. But a number of them are still alive, and I was quite you know, fortunate they agreed to talk to me. There's some great sort of per- personal accounts of him in, in the book, and there's loads of information in here that I didn't know about the case. So I have very much enjoyed the book, and and it is a, a spy story that has sort of got lost o- over time, but it's an intriguing one. Hmm. So who is John Vassell? Where, where does he come from? John Vassell was an Englishman born in 1924, son of a vicar. His father was, at the time of his birth, the uh, chaplain of St Bartholomew's Hospital in central London, where he was born. He had quite a peripatetic childhood because his father never seemed to hold down a clerical job for very, very long. He moved about a lot in his early childhood. His father did actually settle down eventually as the vicar of a Church of England parish in Hendon, northwest London, or Middlesex as, as it was then. Vassal went to boarding school from a relatively early age, went to a couple of prep schools, both in London and Sussex. And then from 1938 onwards, he was a boarder at a minor public school in Monmouth on the border of England and Wales. And it was there that he had his first sexual experiences. It's important to to point out, and clearly vitally important to this story, that Vassal was a gay man and was aware of his sexuality and very certain about his sexuality from his mid-teens onwards. But although he had a sexual awakening in Monmouth in the very late 30s, very early 40s, he wasn't there for very long because in 1941, his father lost his job in Hendon. The reason seems to be that Vassal's mother had converted to Catholicism in the early 1930s and the Church of England being a rather less tolerant place then than it is now, the parishioners in Hendon had not approved of this fact. So Vassal's father, William, left his job, found a much more precarious and more poorly paid job as a Royal Air Force chaplain and effectively, from all the evidence I've seen, could no longer afford to pay the school fees. So Vassal left school at the age of only 16 before he took his school certificate exams, as O-levels were then called and had to get a job, a very menial job, as a clerk in the Midland Bank in London. And a few months later, he moved to a similar clerical job in the Admiralty, which, as I'm sure you know, was the administrative wing of the Royal Navy. So Vassal was very well spoken. He had been reasonably well educated, at least until the age of 16, and was from, in, in some ways, a very, from a very middle-class background. The Vassals were an ancient family with various sort of aristocratic connections. Some of his ancestors had been members of parliament. Some of them had you know, sugar plantation owners in Jamaica and, and, and all the rest of it. But he, he was forced to leave, to leave school at 16. He didn't go on to Oxford, as his father had, and had to take very, very junior pen-pushing roles, first in the Midland Bank and then the Admiralty. There was a brief interruption at the very end of the war when he served in the Royal Air Force for about 18 months as a photographer. Then returned to the Admiralty after he was demobbed in 1947 and stayed there for the next 15 years without really being promoted much. He was always ever in the, he was always only in the clerical branch of the civil service rather than in the more senior executive or administrative branches. So he, he moved about from department to department in London in the late 40s and early 50s was clearly rather bored and frustrated. I think he was probably also rather frustrated socially because as a gay man, he needed to be very you know, surreptitious about his love life. He still lived with his mum and dad in a small flat in St. John's Wood. And in late 1953, he became aware of a vacancy in the British Embassy in Moscow as clerk to the naval attaché there. And he applied for the job, and despite his many shortcomings, he 
managed to emerge from a field of about 40 applicants as the man they wanted to hire. Part of the reason, I think, actually, was that he was unmarried. He was 29 years old, unmarried. And so the housing costs for a single man without a spouse or children were clearly lower than they would be for someone who was married. So he got the job in Moscow, went out there in the spring of 1954, was working for an extraordinary character called Captain Jeffrey Bennett, who was about 15 years older than Basil, a World War II veteran who had been mentioned in dispatches, clearly a high-flying naval officer, quite a serious martinet who Vassal did not particularly got on with. But what's fascinating about Jeffrey Bennett was that, as well as being an illustrious Royal Navy officer, he also moonlighted as an author, both of naval history books, but also naval fiction. So from the late 1940s onwards, Bennett produced a huge number of novels about naval adventures, I guess what I guess you'd call them sort of gripping yarns, very much in the you know Biggles you know genre about you know British naval officers you know, frustrating Russian attempts to steal British submarines or you know discover secrets about them. And one of the one of the great ironies of this case, and as far as I was aware, no one had actually made the connection between you know Jeffrey Bennett, the naval attaché, and Jeffrey Bennett, the novelist, until and, until my research began, was that from the certainly from the autumn of 1954 onwards, Bennett was actually employing a Soviet spy as his clerk while in his spare time writing stories about precisely that kind of espionage. Now, the reason why Vassal became a spy was not because he was in any way ideologically sympathetic to communism. It was a classic case of sexual entrapment and... It's fair to say that Vassal was considered a bit of a misfit in the British embassy, partly because of his sexuality. I'm sure that was an important part of it. But I think the other reason was because he he wanted to fraternise with the diplomats, both at the British embassy and indeed other embassies, whereas because he was in a very junior clerical role, this was rather disapproved of. He tried to get himself invited to the ambassador's wife's bridge parties, for example, and was rebuffed. So... Because he found it quite difficult to befriend the people he wanted to befriend at the British Embassy, he started hanging out with the diplomats of foreign embassies, where he had more social success. And I I understand that he produced some rather fanciful business cards, let's say, that were somewhat economic with the truth of what his actual role was. Yes, I mean his his role was clerk. I mean his you know job title was clerk or clerical officer, whichever you want to put it. But he shortly after arriving in Moscow, he um, had some specially printed business cards made, giving his name as Mister W J C Vassal. I should point out he was technically William Vassal, but he always went by the name John. Mister W J C Vassal, Junior Attaché, British Embassy, Moscow. So he always had this sort of this kind of Walter Mitty tendency to exaggerate his importance, exaggerate the seniority of his job. I mean, very similarly, when he wrote about his World War II service in the RAF, in his memoirs in the mid-70s, he implied that he'd been going on lots of dangerous bombing missions over, you know, Nazi Germany, taking photographs of, you know, such missions. Whereas, in fact, he was almost certainly stuck in a in you know, the dark room in an RAF base in Bedfordshire, developing the films that had been taken by automatic cameras on board bombers. So he, it's fair to say John Vassell had a had a tendency to embroider the truth. And you know the business cards were you know a classic example of that. And I think some people at the at the British Embassy were quite irritated by his trying to be somebody who he wasn't. I'm trying to think of a phrase. There is a phrase for it. Well, he was accused of having ideas above his station. That's what I was looking for. was, I guess, a 1950s code for trying to hang out with the posh people. I mean, in some ways, he was posh. He was incredibly well-spoken, always immaculately dressed, and had always had 
quite expensive tastes and lived beyond his means. I mean, he joined the Conservative Club in St. James's Street in the heart of London's club land in the late 1940s. He was a very young man. I mean, he probably couldn't afford the fees. So he was very much on the frontier of two social classes. And whereas, you know, nowadays, while, of course, Britain is still very class bound today, those social classes are a little bit more permeable. In the 1950s, they were not permeable. And being a clerical officer, he was seen very much as one of the most junior you know, employees of the British Embassy. They obviously had you know, aspirations to become a lot more senior. But, I mean, it was, it was fascinating to find the National Archives, his personnel records from the early 1950s onwards. And in some ways, he was found to be he was a very good typist, so in some ways he was very good at his job in you know technical terms. But he was judged to be effeminate, which was a common euphemism for being gay at the time, judged to be slightly irritating, and also deemed to be somewhat lazy and naive. I think there was a, a reference once to him not fully understanding the political import of a paper he'd been asked to draft. So as a result, he was never quite promoted from the 1940s onwards. He was always deemed to be the kind of person that they want to have a look at and perhaps you know, promote in a year or two's time. But unfortunately, by the time came for his promotion in 1962, he'd already been you know, unmasked as a spy. So how is he recruited by Soviet intelligence? Well, it probably happened in late October 1954. And there's some uncertainty about the date because for obvious reasons, Vassal didn't record these events in his diary at the time. But what, what, what I think happened was that in late 1954, having already fallen into a social circle of Russian men, who may not necessarily have been gay, but they were certainly men who flattered John Vassal and appeared to enjoy his company, and they said, and he certainly seemed to enjoy their company, he was invited to a party, a private room of the Hotel Berlin in Moscow, and he went along... He'd basically been handed over from a man who he did know and had met several times to a bunch of strangers. And I guess at this point, alarm bells should have been ringing that he was invited to dine with a group of three or four men who he'd never met before. But rightly or wrongly, he decided to go along. Much wine was drunk. And Vassal actually was not a very heavy drinker. While he liked parties, he seems to have always drunk the the drinks fairly slowly. But he was plied with a lot of wine on this occasion and then some Russian brandy. And it's pretty clear that either the wine or the brandy or possibly both were spiked. And he was effectively rendered not unconscious, but certainly unable to stand or walk and was invited towards the end of the evening to take a seat on a settee in the corner of the private dining room. And at that point, his clothes were removed. A sexual encounter with at least two other men began while another man took photographs of these events and without going into too much of unsavory detail it's pretty clear that he was he was gang raped by at least two other men but about you know you know one or two in the morning he you know got dressed again and as if as if nothing had happened they called a taxi to take him back to his flat and i guess like many rape victims he he blamed himself. He obviously thought he'd been very, very foolish for having gone to this event. He didn't realise at the time that most, if not all, of the men, sorry, most, if not all, of the Russian men he'd met in Moscow since his arrival in Moscow a few months before had been KGB agents. And his social life continued for a while. He didn't think, by the way, he didn't even you consider the possibility of approaching his superiors at the embassy for one very good reason, which is that homosexuality, of course, was still illegal, both in Russia and, more importantly, in Britain. It wasn't decriminalised until 1967. He'd never, although many people suspected he was gay, he'd never formally come out of a closet. And he feared, probably quite rightly, that if he were to tell his superiors at the embassy that he'd been fraternising with Russian men, his drink had been spiked, he'd had an involuntary sexual encounter with them, he would probably, well, firstly, his diplomatic career, such as it was, would probably be over. He'd be recalled to London, possibly never given another civil service job again. But he would also, more importantly, 
face prosecution either for homosexual activity, which was completely unlawful at the time, or espionage or both. So he decided to keep quiet about what had happened. He also decided to continue to fraternise with the Russian men who had arranged this encounter. And a few months later, he had another sexual encounter with a Russian man in uniform, which was voluntary. Well, certainly Vassil himself said it was voluntary. And after that sexual encounter in you know, a darkened room in a flat somewhere in Moscow, the lights were suddenly switched on. He was asked to get dressed and go into a next door room where some men in overalls confronted him with photographs of the earlier sexual encounter at the Hotel Berlin a few a few months earlier. And it was at that stage that he was told that if he did not comply with their demands, these photographs would be shown to uh, embassy colleagues and potentially printed in British newspapers that his parents might read. And he decided to comply with their instructions. And it was a, a classic case of psychological manipulation. He was not asked from day one, Ian, to hand over documents to the Russians. He was originally told, we just want some general impressions about how the embassy works, what your colleagues are, but also for Vassal's views on political issues and social issues such as homosexuality in Britain. And he decided to start doing this. It was only a few months later, probably in summer of 1955, that he was asked to start producing documents, which he began to extract with remarkably little difficulty from the office that he shared with Jeffrey Bennett and a couple of other couple of other colleagues i mean the, this the the security at the time was frankly woeful both at the british embassy in moscow and also in london where vassal returned in the summer of 1956 in that he had access to a large number of safes many of which had common keys because he was always in a very junior position both in moscow and back in london it, that meant paradoxically that he had access to a wider range of documents than he would have had had he become more senior and specialised. And in the Admiralty, there were never, remarkably, never any random searches of staff, either on their way in or, more crucially, on their way out of the building at the end of the work, work of the working day because some of the senior mandarins had said it would be deemed to be insulting to their integrity if they were searched, which it seems to be a quite astonishing attitude because yeah, as you and I both know, Ian, as I'm sure you know listeners will know too, in many workplaces in Britain today, warehouses, offices, shops even, staff are routinely searched at random on their way in and out of the workplace, even if those workplaces and you know the jobs that people perform inside them has got nothing yeah. to do with national security. I mean, th- this is common with, you know, the Cambridge Five. I mean, Philby talks of just walking out with a briefcase full of documents yeah. and then hand- handing them over to the Russians who would then copy them, hand them back to him, and he'd bring them in the the next day. Yeah, it was exactly the same with Vassal in that both in Moscow and in London, he would he would remove documents either in a briefcase or concealed inside a newspaper or whatever, and then hand them over to a Russian handler for them to be photographed and then return to him later that evening. And he would then replace them in the filing cabinet back in the office the following day before they were missed. He did later on, from the very late 50s onwards, he was supplied with a camera and he started taking his own photographs of documents at home and possibly inside the Admiralty as well, though that's not proved. And then he would hand film from the camera over to his Russian handlers rather than the documents themselves. But I mean, either way, it was a, quite astonishing that he got away with it for seven years. So how long is he in Moscow for? Moscow for just over two years, from the spring of 1954 until the summer of 1956. His tour of duty was actually extended. It was only supposed to be two years. But for various reasons, partly because... Vassal had started impressing his boss, Geoffrey Bennett, and his successor, a man called Adrian Northey, towards the end of his two-year posting. But also there was, I think, the del- there was a you know some technical reason why the lady who was going to succeed him as Clark couldn't take the job. So far from being sent home early from Moscow as a potential security risk, his tour of duty was extended. He didn't return 
back to London until the summer of 1956. The other astonishing thing is that he'd started receiving money from the Russians, not a huge amount, but enough to subsidise a number of foreign holidays. And he did not return directly from Moscow to London. He went on this extraordinary odyssey via Sweden, Norway, the United States, Canada, Mexico, back to Sweden to pick up some luggage and back to London. And no one seems to ask what he had done in this you know, two or three week period between his departure from Moscow and his return to London. And more importantly, no one stopped to ask how this extraordinary degree of foreign travel had been paid for. And he, In the next six years, between 1956 and his capture in 1962, he would regularly go on several foreign holidays per year. And bearing in mind he was on a very low salary, and of course this is the days before budget airlines, so flying around Europe was a relatively expensive business. This, this should have raised some eyebrows um, in the Admiralty. But because he was well-spoken, and if anyone ever asked how he could pay for this lifestyle, he claimed plausibly that he'd inherited some money from an aunt, which he may have done. No no further inquiries were really made. Because it was unheard of for somebody to be having that level of travel in the 1950s, and unless you were really loaded. I mean, to travel to the United States, for example, and Mexico. Yeah. I mean, he did... I mean, sometimes he stayed in hotels, sometimes he stayed in the homes of friends and or lovers. I mean, it's fair to say Vassal had a fairly active love life, you know, both in London and beyond, you know, right up until the time he was captured. It might be a good point now, actually, for me to read an extract from the book about exactly how he spied when he was in London in the late 50s. Um, yeah, please do. Shall I, shall I begin? Yeah. Soon after he returned to London in July 1956... John Vassell met a civil assistant at the Admiralty and was offered a job in the office of the Director of Naval Intelligence, DNI for short. He began working there on the 25th of July. Vassell was back in the Admiralty building, a grand edifice of red brick and Portland stone. As a symbol of the Imperial Royal Navy's power and prestige, it couldn't be beaten. Vassell's new office overlooked Horse Guards Parade, with a view extending to St James's Park and the Garden of Number 10 Downing Street. After the stuffiness of the Moscow embassy, it was a definite step up. Soon, Vassal had a ringside seat to the Suez crisis of October 1956, during which his office became a hive of industry with uniformed staff coming and going for the Ministry of Defence and other agencies. Although some have claimed that his move to the Naval Intelligence Division, NID for short, meant that he must have had a protector or sponsor inside the Admiralty. It was, in fact, common for a clerk returning from a foreign embassy to be allocated to the NID. As in Moscow, Vassal was still a very junior clerical officer, but he later said that from July 1956 to June 1957, he was acting as a secretary to the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, a Captain Best. Vassal never told the Russians he thought Best did not like him and was rude. Some secrets were too intimate to divulge. Incredibly, within two weeks of Vassal starting work at the NID, the DNI himself, Vice Admiral Sir John Inglis, placed Vassal on a list of staff who allowed access to classified atomic information before Vassal's positive vetting was complete. Vassal was made the NID's atomic liaison officer and was given the combination for a steel cupboard in another secretary's room, which he said contained top-secret nuclear matters. Technically, Vassal's atomic clearance lapsed in 1959, but this seems to have made no difference to what he was and was not allowed to see. Most cupboards and cabinets in the offices that Vassal had access to were kept unlocked, during the day at least. Vassal claims he did not resume handing over documents, including the minutes of Admiralty board meetings, to his Soviet handler Gregory until after the Suez Crisis of October 1956. But once he did, he sometimes put them in an On Her Majesty's Service full scap envelope, as if tacitly goading the Admiralty for its woeful security measures. He was now subjected to a new regime of positive vetting, designed to identify employees with extremist views and those vulnerable to blackmail because of alcoholism, heavy debts, homosexuality or other vices. Throughout the 1950s, Whitehall was constantly tightening up security – 
especially after McLean and Burgess's defections in 1951, and after rumours that their old friend Kim Vilby had been their third man emerged in 1955. A statement on the findings of the Conference of Privy Councillors on Security, published in March 1956, said that there is a duty on departments to inform themselves of serious failings such as drunkenness, addiction to drugs, homosexuality, or any loose living that may affect a man's reliability. (laughs) Department heads had a duty to know their staff and they must not fail to report anything which affects security. In 1961, after the jailing of George Blake and the unmasking of the Portland spy ring. To learn more about the Portland spy ring, see our episodes 138 and 139. Now back to the book extract. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan established another committee led by Sir Charles Romer, a Lord Justice of Appeal, to get to the bottom of what was wrong with British naval security. In 1962, Lord Radcliffe conducted a similar review, only to chair yet another inquiry in 1963 after Vassal's conviction. In theory, positive vetting was robust and foolproof, but in practice it was absurdly superficial. Until 1960, the process did not even involve a criminal records check. The novelist Muriel Spark once said that during the Second World War, she secured a job in MI6's political warfare executive, a secret propaganda unit, largely because she was seen bearing an Ivy Compton Burnett novel at an interview, which evidently marked her out as one of us. Vassal's experience shows that the system had not changed much by the late 1950s. The vetting system was handicapped not just by class discrimination, but by a lack of trained staff. Neither interviews nor field inquiries were carried out by MI5, because its Deputy Director Graham Mitchell had recommended that the service was too secret to be exposed to the public. Instead, legwork was done by a procurement executive in the Ministry of Defence, and MI5's only role was to cross-check to see whether those being vetted appeared on lists of people already deemed to be a security risk. It is clear that the authorities did not even attempt to look into Vassal's homosexual relationships, which had never been very discreet about. Vassal's vetting began on the 7th of August 1956 and clearance was granted on the 10th of December. What exactly happened in the intervening four months is not clear. Incredibly, no one spoke to any of Vassal's colleagues or acquaintances in Moscow. Geoffrey Bennett, who had in effect been Vassal's line manager for almost two years, was never spoken to because it was supposed that he was on his way to the Far East. One of the world's biggest military powers seemed to have no way of establishing communication between Whitehall and the Far East. In fact, Bennett was in Portsmouth, barely 60 miles from London. Adrian Northey, that's Geoffrey Bennett's successor, was not contacted either. Vassal was surprisingly honest in his vetting questionnaire, which he completed on the 23rd of August, 1956. In the foreign travel section, he almost ran out of space, listing all his foreign holidays in the last decade to France, Spain... Switzerland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, the United States, Canada, Denmark and Germany. In the days before budget airlines, this was an extraordinary number of foreign holidays for a poorly paid clerk, but no one seems to query them. Vassar was asked to provide two character references. To begin with, he gave Rear Admiral R.M. King, DSO, and a Dr. W.L. Dunlop, living in London, NW4. But King, who Vassal later said was a friend of his mother, told the Admiralty that he had only known Vassal well during the Second World War and had barely seen him since. Dunlop, previously the Vassal family's doctor, said he had not seen Vassal since about 1944. Vassal was told he had to supply new referees who had known him well over the last three years. Rather than people he'd worked with in Moscow, the two referees he supplied were both elderly women and neighbours of the Vassals, Dr. Agnes Franklin, a part-time semi-retired doctor, and Miss Elizabeth Roberts, a retired civil servant, living at 3 Addison House, adjacent to the flat where Vassal's parents lived. It might now appear as if Vassal were trying to exclude from the field of inquiry any close men friends he had, the Radcliffe report concluded in 1963. But Vassal had been overseas for two years, so it may have been concluded that he simply didn't know many men who could be interviewed in London. In 1956, vetting questionnaires asked referees whether candidates were 
free from pecuniary embarrassments, whether they had communist or fascist associations, and whether there were any further circumstances which would tend to disqualify the candidate from government employment of a secret nature. But the form did not directly ask about blackmail or sexuality, and both Roberts and Franklin gave Vassal a clean bill of health. Franklin said that she had known him to attend conservative meetings, while Roberts said that Vassal was most conscientious and decidedly discreet, and that he disliked both communism and fascism. Roberts was careful to point out that he took little interest in the opposite sex, wrote Rebecca West. But the Royal Navy was, however, too innocent to take the old lady's point. Roberts's subtle hints that Vassar was gay do not appear to have prompted any suspicions. While being gay would not automatically make him a security risk, in the 1950s many people believed that it did. Vassal later told MI5 that in the summer of 1956 he spent two hours with the JIB, the Joint Intelligence Bureau, part of the MOD, as part of his vetting. This was not an intrusive interrogation, as Vassal implied. Instead, it seems to have been a friendly chat with Mr E.S. Sherwood, a former Deputy Commissioner of Police in Nigeria, who seemed impressed that Vassal was from a respectable family and that he was a member of the Bath Club. The betting included background checks on Vassal's closest relatives, but the fact that his father was a former Church of England vicar and RAF chaplain, still working as a curate, and that his brother Richard was a heating and ventilation consultant, still living with John and their parents at Addison House, reassured Sherwood that no further checks were necessary. Sherwood concluded that, as Norman Lucas put it, Vassal was a reserved, sober and reliable young man of good character and unquestioned loyalty who appeared to possess a strong dislike of communism and the Soviet way of life. Sherwood's report said, He spoke to me at some length regarding his stay in Moscow and has no wish to return there. But Sherwood does not seem to have asked Vassal or himself. Why not? <laughs> Thank you for that. It's a great extra and it does give, you know, it does give a good view of the book. So th- thank you for that, Alex. How was Vassal passing information to the KGB in London? Well, in London, he used to meet them in sort of suburban locations, normally in north or west London, one of which was outside the Finchley Road and Frognall Railway Station in West Hampstead, which was a, a very odd place for a Soviet spy to meet his KGB handler, bearing in mind Hampstead, was and still is home to many members of parliament, senior civil servants and journalists, but they used to go for quite long walks through the streets of Hampstead, passing very close to where the Labour leader, Hugh Gateskill, lived remarkably. The security was tightened after a while in that they would go to slightly more obscure suburbs of northwest London, slightly less central and less sort of well-known than Hampstead is, normally meet near tube stations. Vassal didn't drive, so Vassal would normally travel to his rendezvous by a tube or train. And while the documents were being photographed by a KGB minion from the Soviet Embassy in London, he would go out for a meal or at least a drinking session in a pub with his main KGB handler, who was until 1961, a man called Gregory, and then from 61 to 62, another man called, he's known to him only by the name Nikolai. So it is, it is astonishing that not only were they meeting on the street corners near tube stations, they would also be seen in public in pubs and restaurants. There's an extraordinary encounter in 1958 where they went to a rather upmarket inn in Harrow-on-the-Hill, which, is, as you know, is a... Mm very prosperous suburb of northwest london home to you know one of britain's foremost public schools but they they once dined together in this inn vassal mistakenly left his overcoat behind in the cloakroom took someone else's overcoat that was very similar by mistake realized his error the following day called the hotel to say look i've got someone else's overcoat has anyone reported an overcoat missing and was told yes there is a gentleman who dined here last night who's you've got your overcoat because he took yours by mistake they were put in touch with each other so they could ar- arrange to exchange the coats turns out the man whose overcoat vassal had taken 
was a serving Scotland Yard police officer who then met Vassal a few days later in you know Trafalgar Square so they could swap overcoats. But, I mean, that was sailing very close to the wind because if oh, Vassal yeah. had put anything in his pocket, either about his rendezvous with the KGB or any Admiralty documents or indeed you know, films of Admiralty documents, the game would have been up. So there were there were a number of close shaves, not because of British ingenuity or because there were any suspicion about Vassal, purely because of you know, rare you know, slip-ups that Vassal had made. Vassal did not use dead drops. So in other words, he did not leave documents you know, hidden in bushes in the park or you know, hidden behind phone boxes or anything like that. He, was, he would always hand over the documents in person. Yeah, it just seems surprisingly poor tradecraft that the KGB were were using and the the risks that they were taking. Yeah, but of course, in those days, there was no CCTV. Yeah, Basil was one of the more junior of several thousand employees in the Admiralty. And so unless Basil came under suspicion, he could be certain he wasn't being followed by MI5. And there was no other way such as CCTV of you know, tracking his movement. So it sounds like from all, all the evidence I've seen, he did not come under any suspicion whatsoever until the spring or possibly even summer of 1962, a few months before his arrest. And I presume MI5 weren't following Soviet embassy staff. They were, but bear in mind, until, until 1961, when... The Berlin Wall was built, and then you had, of course, the Bay of Pigs and you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The Cold War was, I wouldn't say it's a thaw, but there was a, a gradual easing of tensions from the mid-50s onwards, certainly after Stalin's death in 1953. This explains, by the way, that when Vassal was in, was in Moscow, he was not banned from social fraternisation with the Russians at all. The only thing he was told when he arrived in Moscow was that he should avoid meeting Russians in their homes, it was perfectly permitted to meet Russians in public places like hotels, restaurants, etc. And, it, you know, that wasn't, indeed, I, I would go as far as to say, wasn't just permitted. To a certain extent, it was encouraged, partly because there was this sort of naive view that fraternisation with Soviet civilians might help to educate them about the West and make them question communism. But also, it was seen as a useful sort of social safety valve for your embassy staff in Moscow. So, I mean, they did tighten the rules a bit in 1955, and Vassal was told that he should report all social contact to his embassy superiors. But by then it was too late. He'd already been entrapped. Mm. So, I mean, the, the, after Vassal's arrest in 1962, it was claimed that he'd always been completely disobedient. He'd obeyed instructions to steer clear of Russian men or yeah, Russian civilians in general. This is complete nonsense, certainly for the look first 18 months of his time in Moscow, he'd been permitted, if not encouraged, to do so. So I think, you know, once he was back in London from 1956 onwards, bear in mind that, you know, Khrushchev actually visited London in 1956 for a state visit. In 1955, while Vassal was still in Moscow, the British Royal Navy visited Leningrad and Russian civilians were invited on board Royal Navy warships. Vassal was there, by the way. Mm. So the, it, it was not the, the the Cold War in the 1950s and the very early 60s was a lot less frosty than it became later on in the 60s and 70s. And Vassal, yeah. I think, yeah, benefited from that because as a result, the security was somewhat more lax as well. Absolutely. So he's he's very much off the radar as far as MI5 is is concerned. You know, he's he's a very low level employee who shouldn't have access to anything that's sort of going to be wanted by the Russians. So how is he caught? How, do the, how does MI5 get on the trail of him? Well, there were three defectors in 1961 or very early 1962. Three defectors from the Eastern Bloc approached the Americans and reported that there was a spy still at large who was in the Admiralty. Now, in early 1961, a spy ring centred on a Royal Navy establishment in Porton, Dorset, had been uncovered. There were some documents found in their possession which were judged 
unlikely to have been handed over by their main contact in Portland, a man called Harry Houghton. And the press reported this at the time, and certainly the Americans were concerned about it, as were elements inside MI5. So there were, it was clear, or not clear, but it was certainly likely that there was another spy or spies still at work in the British Admiralty. And what the defectors said in 1961 and the very beginning of 1962 was to confirm this. And they gave, well, at least one of them gave some very detailed clues about the man that the British had to look for. They didn't name John Bassel, but they did say this was a man who'd worked in the British Embassy in Moscow in the mid-1950s as a clerk to the naval attaché, was gay or, or homosexual, as, as was a common term at the time, and had since worked in the Admiralty in London, including a spell working for a minister. Vassal, as I'll explain later, you know, worked in the private office of a minister for about two years in 57 to 59. Now, given those clues, it shouldn't have been all that difficult for the British to narrow down the search to one man, John Vassal. But partly because of you know, general lethargy in the corridors of power in Whitehall, and partly because I think Vassal was seen to be a respectable man. He converted to Catholicism in the early 1950s, was a devout Roman Catholic and the son of a Church of England vicar. It took several months from early 1962 until September 1962 when he was finally arrested for the penny to finally drop within the special branch, the Admiralty and MI5, that John Vassar was their man. And in the meantime, he carried on handing over secrets. Indeed, his most prolific spirit period as a spy was probably from the spring of 1962 onwards. So in the final five or six months of his espionage, when he had access, he, he was acting up as a personal assistant of some kind and had access to even more sensitive documents about British defence secrets than he'd had he'd had before. So he was caught, and as I'm sure I'm going to explain later, his capture, however, was not greeted by you know applause or you know jubilation in the press or in Parliament that another Soviet spy had been caught. It was actually greeted with derision because it you know, rapidly became clear that Vassil had been spying since at least 1955, if not earlier, and had been getting away with it for a period of six or seven years. And and also, of course, there'd been several similar spy scandals in the last few years. The Portland spies in 1961, the year before that in 1960, George Blake had been jailed for a record-breaking 42 years for his espionage on behalf of the Soviet Union. The story of George Blake features in our episode 164, so the Vassal case really was the final straw for many in the American you know, defence community. They they decided that the British were completely unreliable and some sensitive sort of nuclear secrets were no longer shared by the Americans, the British. And also in political terms, and this is one thing that's been overlooked partly because of the concentration on the Perfumo scandal, in political terms, the Vassal scandal came dangerously close to toppling the Macmillan government at the time. It did manage to teeter on for another year or two until, until the Perfumo scandal and then their electoral defeat in 1964, but they had a pretty close shave in 1962 as well. So where was he arrested and what was his immediate reaction to arrest? Well, he was arrested in an incredibly cinematic location. The Admiralty, which is now the you know, Department of International Trade, sits between the Mall and Horse Guards Parade very distinctive red brick and Portland stone building. Vassal left his office one day, 12th of September 1962, by one of the northern exits of the Admiralty. He was going to walk, he was planning to walk across Trafalgar Square to the post office in the northeastern corner of Trafalgar Square to pick up some foreign currency because he was due to go on another holiday in Italy the following week. But as almost as soon as he left the Admiralty, he was accosted by two or three plainclothes policemen wearing you know, Macintoshes, third man style, as Vassal said, who asked him to accompany him into a waiting police car. And within a few minutes after he was joined by another senior police officer inside the car, 
he realised the game was up. And what is quite remarkable about this case is that bearing in mind a lot of other British Cold War spies, certainly the Cambridge Five spies who were who were interrogated in court, and you know, some of them weren't the Portland spies, George Blake and others, their initial response was to deny everything and to you know protest they couldn't possibly be a spy. Whereas Vassal immediately confessed all. In fact, he actually started his confession in the police car on the way from the Mall to Scotland Yard, which is only about a mile away. So he, he I think in, in a sense he was relieved because, as I've explained earlier, and he was not an ideological spy. He had no sympathy with the Russians at all. He had decided it was the easiest way out to comply with their, with their demands. And while he was certainly going to face a long jail sentence, he wasn't going to face the firing squad, which was one of the things he always had nightmares about while he was spying. So I think his arrest, in a way, was was a form of relief. So it sounds like the Soviets hadn't told him what to do if he was caught. No, they hadn't, as far as I can tell. That's a very good question. As far as I can tell, the Soviets had always assured him, even after the Portland spies were arrested in early 1961, that... He was safe. Now, Vassal was not part of a network. His only contacts were with either Gregory, which was the sort of your cover name of his KGB handler from 56 till 1961, and then Nikolai, who was his handler for the last year or two. He never had any contact with any other spies. He wasn't even aware of the existence of the Portland, of, you know, the Portland spy ring. And he was reassured that his identity would not be well certainly would not be divulged by the Russians, but would not be would not be discovered because the Russians had been so careful to not tell Vassal about other spies, but more importantly not tell other spies about about Vassal. Now, some evidence has emerged since that the Russians may have actually consciously blown him because they wanted to protect or distract attention away from another more senior spy in the Admiralty. Now, there's not any definitive evidence on this in the new archive material I've seen. It is is certainly a possibility. It is suspicious that Nikolai, the Russian handler of Vassal, went to Moscow, supposedly on holiday, a few days before, not after, a few days before Vassal's arrest, and the holiday became a permanent holiday. He never came back to London afterwards. So mm. there is some circumstantial evidence that the Russians may have possibly sent one of these defectors as an effective double agent to speak to the Americans to help pinpoint Vassal. And they were willing to sacrifice Vassal because they were getting information from a more senior source in the Admiralty and they thought it was more likely that he would escape detection if Vassal had been caught. Because I think in, in the, the later investigations, there's a suspicion that there is a network of spies almost i think it's described as sort of like a cabal of spies operating and he's got a senior protector yes somewhere who's been looking after him yes i mean it's fair to say the immediate aftermath of the john vassal scandal was not the british press's finest hour and i could talk about this all evening but just to give you a sort of a, an idea of the, of the climate at the time the British press launched in a sort of homophobic rampage in that, I mean, Vassal was, according to people who met him, quite a camp man. A lot of people guessed he was he was gay, but he was turned from a human being into a collection of you know, homophobic tropes. And there was allegations were made that Vassal was part of a large network of gay spies, both in Westminster and Whitehall. Now, he had worked, as I mentioned earlier, he, he'd worked for a minister in the Admiralty between 1957 and 1959, a man called Tam Galbraith, who was civil lord of the Admiralty. Now, paradoxically, the Russians had actually not been pleased when Vassal moved from his job in naval intelligence to a job in Galbraith's private office because Galbraith's ministerial portfolio covered things like shipbuilding, personnel matters, the buildings that the Admiralty occupied. It was not really concerned with military matters or military secrets. So while Vassal worked as a clerk in you know, Galbraith's private office for two years, the material he handed over to the Russians was not really of 
great interest in them. And there's no evidence whatsoever that Galbraith was a very well regarded Conservative MP and a minister who was sort of tip of my office. There's no evidence whatsoever that Galbraith was sympathetic towards the Soviet Union or was aware of Vassal's espionage, let alone being an accomplice in it. But the, the press put it together, put two and two together and made five, and alleged that Vassal and Galbraith had been gay lovers. But not only that, Galbraith had been an accomplice in Vassal's spying. And when Vassal had been arrested in September 1962, the two men had been on the verge of defecting to Moscow together. All theories for which there was no evidence whatsoever apart from the fact that there had some form of friendship had developed between Vassal and Galbraith. Galbraith was about eight years older than Vassal. I think Vassal may have regarded him as a bit of an older brother. He'd gone up to his home in Scotland probably six or eight times over a two-year period to deliver urgent papers to the minister's private office. He lunched at least once at Galbraith's home in Westminster, along with Galbraith's wife. Galbraith himself had visited, again with his wife, Vassal's own flat in Dolphin Square. So there clearly was some kind of fraternisation between the two of them, and there were a couple of letters which were addressed to my dear Vassal, rather than dear Vassal, which the press implied were was a clear sign of some kind of, well, at the very least, mutual sexual attraction, if not a gay affair, I don't think they were mutually attracted to each other, or if Vassal was attracted to Galbraith, it certainly wasn't requited. And of course, in those days, my dear Vassal, which might seem like quite an intimate thing to say nowadays, was quite a common way of people to write to each other. It's certainly true that Vassal never addressed in his own letters to Galbraith. Vassal always called him Sir or Civil Lord. Galbraith only ever addressed him by his by his surname. But I mean, Galbraith became a convenient fall guy in in the affair after the, yeah, the reporting restrictions were obviously suspended after Vassal's sentencing in on the 22nd of October 1962 and the letters which Galbraith had sent to Vassal had been obtained by the press. Some of them are printed in the Sunday Pictorial newspaper. Others were actually quite remarkably released by the government itself as a way of you know, preempting what the press was about to reveal and on the 8th of November 1962, so only two and a half weeks after Vassal's conviction, Galbraith was was forced to resign. There, there, is an, there is an interesting connection between the Vassal scandal and the Profumo one in that one of the reasons why the press was so unsympathetic towards Profumo and the Macmillan government in general in the spring and summer of 1963 was that the press felt they'd been treated so badly during the Vassal scandal because although the press had not behaved well and they'd clearly you know hounded an almost certainly innocent minister out of office two reporters ended up being jailed for refusing to reveal the sources of their stories about about Vassal in early 63. Fleet Street was so furious about this that when the first inklings of the Profumo scandal happened. They uh, decided to you know, go after Profumo Hammer and Tong since he was finally forced to resign in June. Equally, the government, having accepted the resignation or you know, ordered the resignation of Tam Galbraith in November 1962, was very reluctant to see another minister resign amidst a sexual scandal with a you know, espionage you know, dimensions. That's, that may explain why Profumo initially denied any connection with Christine Keeler and managed to hang on for another four months, by which time the, you know, the connection between Christine Keeler and Eugene Ivanov had come to light. And it sort of, the, it had, you know, Profumo had escalated from a mm. sexual scandal into a national security one. In my, in my view, you know, for what it's worth, what the Profumo scandal, while absolutely fascinating, probably had little, if any, national security significance because there's no evidence that any you know, sensitive defence secrets were divulged either by John Profumo to Christine Keeler or you know, by Christine Keeler to Eugene Ivanov. But because I think you know, one of the reasons why Profumo is remembered so clearly today and the Vassal scandal isn't is 
quite simply one of gender and sexuality in that Profumo was a heterosexual man and the story features a number of young women in swimsuits, whereas Vassal was a gay man and almost the entire cast of the Vassal story are men, not women. Mm. So Vassal has no trial, is that correct? No trial because he immediately pleaded guilty. Right. And what is remarkable about this is you, you would have thought nowadays, sitting here in 2024, you would have thought he would have quite a, well, if not a defence, then certainly quite a you know, robust plea of mitigation to say, yes, I did wrong. Of course, I shouldn't have handed over the defence secrets. But what was I to do? I was being blackmailed. And the British state, certainly in the mid-1950s, and you know, to a lesser extent in the early 1960s, was remarkably unsympathetic towards men who were found to be gay and had nothing to do with espionage. I mean, there were a huge number of cases in the 1950s and early 60s of men whose careers were utterly destroyed purely because of one sexual indiscretion with other men. But what I think happened was that Vassal actually did not tell his defence lawyers, or indeed the police, or MI5, the full story of what had happened in the Hotel Berlin, partly because he was just embarrassed about having been such an idiot and still felt residual shame about having been the victim of rape. He had an excellent barrister, a man called, a man called Jeremy Hutchinson, who was a veteran of lots of espionage trials of the early 1960s. He you know, represented Penguin Books and the Lady Chatterley's Lover trial of... 1960, I think it was, a very liberal man, I'm sure very sympathetic towards Vassal for being a gay man. The the lengthy speech of mitigation that Hutchinson gave in the Old Bailey on Vassal's behalf did not actually refer to the fact that he'd been raped or that he'd been drugged. And I think the reason he didn't do that was because Vassal hadn't told him, and the full story didn't come out until... 1975, when Vassal published his memoirs a few years after after leaving prison. So he pleaded guilty. He didn't exercise his right to speak before sentence was handed down. And Lord Justice Parker, the Lord Chief Justice of England, handed down a sentence of 18 years. Not a record-breaking sentence, because a couple of years earlier, or, or rather one year earlier, George Blake had been sentenced to 42 years. But certainly long enough to be personally devastating. Vassal spent most of, not all, but most of his sentence in in Maidstone Jail. He was there for the last six years of his sentence, but before that he was at Wormwood Scrubs and briefly at Durham and was a model prisoner from all the evidence I've seen. He actually had a remarkably peaceful time in jail. He was not ill-treated by other prisoners. I think they saw him as more of a an object of curiosity rather than scorn, was deemed to be very, very honest, told MI5 everything he knew. They interviewed him dozens of times in Wormwood Scrubs between from 63 onwards or late 62 onwards, told them everything he knew about his Soviet handlers, about the information he'd handed over, their methodologies, about the fact that he had, had no sponsors or protectors or accomplices in the, in the Admiralty. And as a result, because of this this level of good behaviour and cooperation, he was released exactly 10 years after his imprisonment in October 72. And while he was in prison, did he meet any of the other Cold War spies that had been arrested, such as George Blake and some of the Portland spies? Well, he knew George Blake, and this has been quite well documented, both by Blake and Vassal and by other people who were in the jail at the time. So he knew George Blake in Wormwood Scrubs between 62 and 64. George Blake, of course, at the time, was beginning to plan his sensational escape from Wormwood Scrubs, which he eventually escaped from in 1966. But Vassal was not you know, privy to the plan. I mean, fair to say that Vassal thought he and George Blake were closer friends than... George Blake did, and George Blake was very much an elite prisoner in you know, Wormwood Scrubs, and Vassal was only ever on the fringes of his circle. It does seem quite remarkable nowadays that 
to two British men who'd been convicted of spying for the Russians were allowed to fraternise quite extensively in the same wing of the same prison. But there was, there was a shortage of high security prisons in those days. So there was always concern about where prisoners would be put. And I mean, I found this extraordinary correspondence in the National Archives between MI5, the prison service and the Home Office about which prisoner should be moved where. And there was there were a couple of times in the early 60s where George Blake was very nearly moved out of Wormwood Scrubs to allow Vassal to stay at Wormwood Scrubs. But it was very convenient for MI5 to have Vassal in London jail rather than a jail outside London. But eventually, in 1964, Vassal was moved to Maidstone jail and Blake stayed at Wormwood Scrubs with disastrous consequences because he managed to escape from Wormwood Scrubs sensationally in 1966. Had, had of course, you know, the opposite decision been made, you know, George Blake had been moved out of Wormwood Scrubs and uh, Vassal had stayed there, the, the outcome would have been very different. And George Blake may well have served the full 42 years of his sentence rather than escaping after only six years to spend the rest of his life in Moscow. Yes, indeed. Indeed. How did John Vassal try and rebuild his life after prison well he was quite a poor man and of course the press continued to allege he still had a large stash of russian gold somewhere what had actually happened was that any money he'd received from the russians it it was part-time salary he received from the russians it was it was a significant amount of money but not a vast one he had not saved it for a rainy day he'd basically blown most, if not all, of his money from the Russians on clothes, meals out, holidays, etc. Although he'd sold his story to the Sunday Pictorial while he was on remand in 1962 and been paid £5,000, quite a large sum of money in the early 1960s, most of that had gone on legal fees, so he was penniless. And he spent much of the time in 1973 working as a volunteer librarian in a catholic monastery in sussex he then moved to kent kept writing begging letters to his former barrister jeremy hutchinson and others asking for a job in the antiques trade or as a personal assistant people didn't want to hire him because of his notoriety but he he changed his name to john phillips i don't think he changed it through deed poll but he may as well have done because for all intents and purposes he would always use his name rather his new name, John Phillips and Correspondence, Employment References, and so on. And he eventually landed at some point in 1974 a job as a secretary at an outfit called the British Records Association, which was, indeed still is, the professional body for archivists, and was hired as John Phillips. I don't know whether the senior management knew of his real identity, but I managed to meet two women who had worked with him, one of them in the 1970s, the other one 20 years later in the early 1990s, and neither of them had become aware of his real identity as John Vassal until several months, in one case a full year, after they began working alongside him because he was, for understandable reasons, very cagey about talking about the past, and they only found out his real identity by accident in both cases. So he, I mean, he, he did have a brief period in the spotlight in early 1975 when his memoirs were published they weren't very well reviewed they didn't really although they very importantly told the full story of exactly what had happened in the hotel berlin which is important for posterity they didn't spill the beans about many other things they didn't spill the beans about who vassal's many lovers had been exactly what secrets he'd handed over to the russians as a result the books were you know, the book was not serialised in some of the newspapers and Vassal had originally, it rather sank without trace. And I think Vassal very quickly afterwards you know, regretted having written the book and certainly never wrote about his own life again, but also, as far as I could tell, was never actually interviewed by British journalists for pretty much the next 20 years until he died in 1996. He died in... He died of a heart attack on a London bus outside Baker Street tube station in September 1996, you know, just after he'd turned 72, I believe. So he lived to a fairly, fairly good age, but he, his death was not, was not reported in the media until more than two weeks afterwards, after his funeral, 
because he'd sank into such obscurity and was obviously going and was certainly buried and had his will registered under a under a different name. So he was mm. almost a sort of forgotten, you know, footnote of the you know recently ended Cold War by the time of his death. Whereas of course at the time, in late sixty two and early sixty three, he'd been anything but a footnote. He'd been he'd been a headline in scores, if not hundreds, of newspaper stories. How important were the secrets that Vassal had given to the KGB? I mean, amongst the Cold War spies, wh- where does he he rank? I would say probably. Well, on a on a scale of one to ten, he was probably he was probably a number seven. He may not have been the most significant spy. He certainly didn't hand over the names of agents as George Blake did. He certainly didn't hand over the your precise whereabouts of the you know, American submarine fleet as you know John Anthony Walker did. But he did hand over a huge amount of material over a seven year period of time. Now of course Vassal for obvious reasons did not keep a you know written list of the secret he'd handed over and you know for equally obvious reasons the archives in Moscow are somewhat difficult to access at the moment. But from all the evidence that I've seen, it was an awful lot of material he handed over about the Royal Navy, about in particular its submarine fleet, the Polaris missile technology that had been developed. At the time of his trial, or rather sentencing hearing, the significance of his spying was, if anything, exaggerated slightly because, of course, the Crown wanted to make sure he was given a very, very lengthy sentence. When it became to a public inquiry chaired by... Lord Radcliffe, a few months later, his significance as a spy was somewhat downplayed because, of course, they wanted to reduce the political fallout from from the political scandal that had then had then developed. But I, I think I think it's fair to say there was a lot of stuff that was handed over, and it was incredibly humiliating for the British because he hadn't he hadn't worked in some you know, obscure corner of the Admiralty as important spy Harry Houghton had. He had worked in the British Embassy in Moscow, and then in the Admiralty building itself, including in the private office of a minister for for the next six years. Did you find any other sort of surprising information in, in the National Archives that you just thought, wow, that is something that's really not been talked about before? Well, yes. I mean, Vassal had a, as I've said earlier, a fairly active love life. And in his last winter of freedom, so the winter of 1961 to 1962, he befriended two backbench Conservative MPs. Now, the irony is, of course, after his arrest, poor Tam Galbraith, who, in my view, certainly did not have a sexual relationship with John Vassell, was forced to resign. There were two other MPs who Vassell probably did have certainly a romantic relationship with, if not a sexual one, in the last few months before his capture and arrest, managed to get away with it. Their names were Fergus Montgomery and Sir Harmon Nichols, neither of whom were very prominent MPs. I mean, Fergus Montgomery served briefly as personal private secretary to Margaret Thatcher when she was leader of the opposition in the in the mid-1970s, and then stepped down from that job because... Apparently, Thatcher was told by MI5 he'd had a connection to to John Vassell back in the early 60s. But he remained an MP until 1997. Didn't serve as a minister again, but certainly remained an MP. So Harmer Nichols, who Vassell probably knew slightly better, and Vassell said he had had a sexual relationship with. Vassell said he'd not had a sexual relationship with Montgomery, but he had had a sexual relationship with Nichols. Nichols managed to emerge entirely unscathed and there was never any suggestion, certainly no media reports about any connection between Sir Harmon Nichols and John Vassell during his lifetime. He died in 2000 or indeed since until I discovered the relevant material in the National Archives recently. Sir Harmon Nichols was the Conservative MP for Peterborough from 1950 to 1974 was only ever a very, very junior minister, but was quite a well-known man because Peterborough in those days was one of the most marginal constituencies in Britain. So 
um, quite often one of the one of the more sort of entertaining features of election night in Britain was waiting to see whether Harmer Nichols would survive in Peterborough, and he always did. In one case, by only three votes in 1966, wow. until he was finally defeated in October 1974. I and mean, I have a bit of a personal interest in this, isn't that my my home here in Northamptonshire happens to be within the old boundaries of you know, Harmer Nichols' you know, former constituency. And I've spoken to a couple of people locally who knew Harmer Nichols when he was an MP. Generally a very well well regarded MP. There was some speculation, although he was married and had a daughter, there was some speculation both locally and in Westminster about his sexuality, but no suggestion whatsoever about any connection with John Vassell and Remained an MP until October 1974, when Labour finally defeated him, but then promptly was given a peerage as Lord Harmer Nichols, remained in the House of Lords for the next 25 years until his death in 2000, and indeed served as an MEP briefly in Greater Manchester in the early 1980s. So his political career was in no way impeded by certainly having had a friendship. He you know, never denied that he'd been friends with John Vassell when he was questioned mm. by MO5. He did deny having had a sexual relationship with John Vassell, but John Vassell was very clear with MI5. He said, I'd had a sexual relationship with Sir Harmer Nichols, which was somehow completely hushed up at the time. I mean there's wow. a huge amount of not just homophobia, but also hypocrisy, because there were many members of Parliament, most of them conservative, who found their careers were either severely curtailed or indeed terminated either because they were gay or they were sympathetic towards decriminalisation or they'd had any kind of connection with John Vassell. There's another MP called Denzel Freeth, who is certainly not a household name now, but he was in the mid-1950s, was seen to be a sort of young 30-something conservative MP of the sort of Geoffrey Howe generation who was tipped for high office. But merely because he was known to be a closet gay and because he'd allegedly once attended a what was termed a homosexual party with John Vassell, he was asked to vacate his safe seat in Basingstoke at the 1964 election and never re-entered Parliament again. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I mean, when, when you look back at Vassell, I mean, I think you, you said... You know, you didn't think he was entirely to to blame for his spying. He was just put in an impossible situation by well, this rape in Moscow. Yeah, I mean, he had look. He, the man had many flaws, like like all human beings. He was vain, although he was very well spoken and presentable. Frankly, he wasn't very bright, as far as I can tell. He had a very superficial and rather vague um, and self centered view of the world. He was. A snob who'd constantly, you know, boast to all and sundry about the famous people he'd met or who he knew, he did not deserve to be raped, and he certainly didn't deserve to be jailed for for eighteen years, in in my view. And had homosexuality been decriminalised earlier, or had homosexuality not been a crime at the time that he was entrapped, I think the blackmailer would have still had some power, but it would have been considerably less power. And of course, there were other cases in Moscow in the 1960s, you know, 50s and 60s, in fact, of heterosexual men who were entrapped heterosexually by the KGB, who did fess up to their embassy and said, look, I've been a bloody idiot. I've had, you know, had a Russian mistress She's now claiming that photographs or assignations have been taken and I'm being blackmailed into. And they were recalled to London, but they weren't fired. I mean, it was quite astonishing case. A man called Geoffrey Harrison, who was the British ambassador in Moscow in the late 60s, you know, 10 years after, you know, more than 10 years after Vassal had been there, had an affair with a chambermaid. And, you know, lo and behold, it turns out, that she'd been contacted by the KGB and secret photographs had been taken and he was asked to hand over secrets, otherwise the photographs would be revealed. He called the KGB's bluff by saying to the Foreign Office in London, I've been a bloody idiot, I'm being blackmailed. They recalled him to London, but they didn't fire him and he managed to retire on a, on a full pension and you know, knighthood and what have you only, only a few years later. So there was a huge difference between the way heterosexual 
victims of entrapment and gay victims of entrapment like John Vassell were were treated. So I, I can quite understand why John Vassell decided the least worst option was to was was to carry on spying. And there's been a lot of frankly ridiculous speculation in the last 60 years not only that Vassal was part of a you know secret network of you know gay spies at work in Whitehall and Westminster but also he was part of some sort of grand plan not just to hand over defense secrets to the Russians but sort of bring down the entire British establishment well if he if he was really really intent on doing so he would have told the old Bailey the newspapers Uncle Tom Uncle Tom Cobbley and all about the fact that it had sexual relations with two or at least one Conservative MPs, he would also have you know, exaggerated the scale of his friendship with Tam Galbraith and confirmed what newspapers were saying that they'd allegedly been gay lovers. In fact, he always consistently denied in newspaper interviews, in his memoirs and discussions with MI5 that he'd had any kind of sexual relationship with Tam Galbraith and he, sometimes even you know, denied having ever been sexually attracted to Tam Galbraith. So I think although, of course, he did wrong and probably deserved to be punished in some ways, he didn't deserve to be jailed for 18 years. And more importantly, he did all he could to actually limit the damage he inflicted in that he was very, very contrite afterwards, told MI5 everything he knew. I mean, even at one stage, Ian, when he was in jail in Wormwood Scrubs, he actually took MI5 on a drive around the suburbs of North and West London, pointing out exactly where they'd met the Russians, why those locations had been chosen, where they'd gone to have a drink, where they'd gone to have a meal, which was very, very useful to MI5, just find out how KGB handlers operated in London. But he was betrayed by MI5 because while MI5 were just saying to him, look, if you tell us everything you know that you haven't already told us about your spying, your love life, your social life, we just we just want to fill in the blanks and we'll obviously ask the Home Office to consider releasing you as early as possible in return for your help. He, perhaps naively, he just thought he was helping to mitigate the scale of his crimes. But what actually happened was MI5 started a sort of homophobic witch hunt into every man that... Vassal had ever known, and a number of people, not just the MPs I mentioned, but a number of other men, one of whom a very high-flying Australian diplomat, another a wing commander in the Royal Air Force, had their careers abruptly terminated purely because Vassal told MI5 that he had known them socially. In fact, he th- I, think, I think in both cases, he actually only told MI5 that had sex relationships after their dismissal. So it's not as if Vassal, you know, dobbed them in. And of course, their names had already been discovered in, you know, diaries, address books and what have you. So he, he, was, he was then falsely accused of having betrayed his friends, which is, if anything, is the opposite of the truth. So I think he wasn't just badly treated by the Russians. He was badly treated by the press. He was badly treated by the British justice system. And has also, on many occasions, not always, on many occasions, been badly treated by historians in the five or six decades since. I see. I mean, I see the whole story in a nutshell. I see the story, not just an astonishing story of one man and his life being destroyed by the Cold War, but also and it's a really important chunk of British post-war history, espionage history, political history, social history that. Yeah, you know, for the reasons we've discussed, has been, in my view, unfairly overlooked in the six decades since. You have been listening to Alex Grant, the author of Sex, Spies and Scandal, The John Vassal Affair. The book is available via links in the episode notes, which will help support the podcast. Don't miss the episode extras, such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.